Uh, I want to welcome everybody out. Welcome those who are watching online and listening online. Uh, we are in a series called Address the Mess over First and Second Corinthians. Uh, but today I'm not going to really go into a deep you know, recall of any of the rest of the book other than 13 because there's a lot to cover. So I'm going to try to catch you up for chapter 13 because this is the chapter about love. love. There you go. And what does everybody think it's for? Weddings. Weddings and it's not. Anyway, um, what does love have to do with weddings? But no, I'm just kidding. Anyway, um, so I'm going to catch you up as to what we've done so far in chapter 13. Uh, this is one of the greatest chapters. I love this. One of the greatest chapters in the book because you learn so much, and we are not going to get very far today. Okay, so two weeks ago we began looking at the biblical definition uh, of love as described by the Apostle Paul. Now, uh, I'll just read this to you. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 says, Love is patient, love is kind, and is not jealous, does not brag, and is not arrogant. Speaking of patience... <laughs> First service, I had, I take this new medicine, it's drying me out, and everybody kept coming up going, your whole mouth was like white. And I'm like, you couldn't like tell me that before? <laughs> so if you see that, like give me a sign. Anyway, uh, so anyway, verses four through eight uh, describe a kind of love called agape. In the Greek, they, they don't use love as loosely as we do. We say, I love my car, I love pizza, I love my wife, I love my dog, and hopefully those are all different loves. Um, but they are very specific, and the love that's used in verses 4 through 8 is agape love, and it means uh, sacrificial or unconditional love, sacrificial and unconditional love. Now, biblically, this is considered the love that God is, that God shows, and that God gives is agape love, okay? And agape is the love that's always present in the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is always present in everyone who's believed, so you should always have at least the framework in there to be as loving as you should be because the Holy Spirit is in you if you've believed. And it's that agape love that kind of enables believers to be successful and enables them to be obedient and productive. Now, I'm trying to get through this as quick as I can. Hold on. All right. Now, Paul used agape in Galatians 5.22 when describing the fruit of the Spirit. If you want to look at that real quick, starting in verse 22, it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now, we also learned last uh, a couple weeks ago that love is a what? Action. Love is an action. That's right. And every action that it produces glorifies God or should glorify God. Now, in verse, po in verse 4, though, Paul starts describing the actions that are associated with this agape love, which is where we get this list that we've been going through. So we've already looked at love is patient and love is kind. Uh, the Greek word for patient, anybody remember it? <laughs> yeah, as if. I don't even remember if I have it in front of me. No, uh, the Greek word for patient is makrothromeo, and it means to delay. And basically that's saying to delay the natural response to anger and frustration. Uh, then we looked at the word kind, which is krestioumai, which means to act with kindness and mercy. And then we just touched on love does not brag, but that's what we're going to, I'm going to back up and cover that again, and we'll start there this week, because there's a lot there I want to cover. So I titled today's message, Loving Humility, because I think humility uh, and love biblically, they go hand in hand. Um, the love that Jesus displayed to us by dying on the cross, we see through the humility of being willing to be made man and being willing to be uh, innocently murdered so that we could have eternal life. So we see that coming together. So now, okay, we're caught up. You guys ready? All right, love does not brag and is not arrogant. Okay, bragging and arrogance are very closely related. They're, they're very closely related. The difference is one is external and one is internal, right? Uh, and first, bragging is simply the byproduct of worldly pride. That's what it is. And um, it's an external sin. This is the external one. The word brag in the Greek is periperuomai, and it means public boasting. That's what makes it external. It's public boasting. Uh, and bragging about our gifts, the, uh, the reason Paul put this in here was the Corinthians loved to be looked up to. They loved to be admired. They wanted to be respected. They just loved being the big dog. So it was very important to them that people saw them through eyes of respect. So uh, more than likely, they bragged a lot. I mean, a lot. And that's why he brought this up. Because when you brag about your gifts, it is insulting and irreverent toward God. And it's important to realize that because by bragging, we're claiming that those gifts and those abilities are of our own design. I mean, you think about it. What do we have to brag about? Anything good in me comes from him. 
right? You know when I'm doing it because that's a train wreck. I'm just letting you know, you know, so we have nothing to brag about. But when we brag, we act like it's by our own design, our gifts are. Uh, And only either a complete fool or someone who doesn't know God would believe that anything good comes from us. It all comes from God. Now, have you ever noticed, and I mean, if they're sitting by you, don't look at them. But have you ever noticed the awkwardness of when someone is bragging on themselves? You guys notice that? Come on, am I the only one? You guys notice that, right? Okay, good. And I'll tell you why. I'm going to give you an example. I really shouldn't, but I'm going to. Um, there was a guy, a, a guy, a friend of mine, and he was really, really short. And uh, we were hanging out one time, and we were driving around, and I'll never forget, we're sitting at a stoplight. And he looks over at me, and he goes, did you see that? I go, well, I'm driving, so probably not. And he said, did you see that? And I said, what? He goes, the girl's in the car beside us. I'm like, again, driving, married, why not? And he goes, they are totally checking me out. <laughs> And I went, did you get a booster seat? Because I don't know if they're going to see you. But no, I didn't say that, but I thought it. No, but uh, that guy would just, I mean, he was something else. He, he had more, enough confidence for everybody in this room about his looks. But we'll deal with that as we move on. But anyway, that's what I think of. It's, just, it's weird when people are, are, are bragging on themselves. And I believe that's because it's just natural for us to realize that Bragging on ourselves shouldn't happen. I think it's just a natural reaction that God has put in us to say we have nothing to brag about. I, I struggle even looking people in the eye when they're doing that. I don't know if I, am I the only one? Can you look somebody in the eye when they're going, by the way, I'm great, you know? <laughs> that one's kind of tough for me. Because all I can think about when somebody's doing that is, is how ignorant laying claim to God's handiwork is. It's just ignorant. You know, remember what I said last week about the worms eating you? Still legit today. I'm telling you, uh, maybe that's healthy, maybe not, but I am always concerned because I believe that anything good we do, obviously, uh, comes from God. Now, uh, there's one thing I've learned in 30 years of working with people, um, and I've worked with them in coaching and and in pastoring, and, and I've learned that deep down, way deep inside of us, the people who are bragging don't really believe what they're bragging about either. Generally, they don't really believe uh, what they're bragging about. Generally, people who brag are trying to compensate uh, for their insecurities. Generally, they're trying to put the words out there that they want to hear. You know what I mean? And that's generally what it is because very few people actually believe their own hype. Now, if someone does actually believe their own hype, they fall into a totally different category, which takes us to our next word, love is not arrogant. If you really believe your hype, you are arrogant, right? So the second word described as arrogant, and it comes from the Greek word fusio, and fusio simply means to make proud or to be proud. It describes an internal sin of pride. This is the internal part, okay? And pride is an absolute cancer. Have you ever noticed that the world tells us our whole lives, be proud? You ever, you ever notice that? Where's your pride? Things like that. And the scriptures tell us the absolute opposite of that. They're saying, don't be proud, right? Now, pride is a cancer. It'll destroy believers, and left unchecked, it'll destroy churches. It's unbelievable. If you look at Proverbs 16, 18, it said, pride goes before what? Destruction. Destruction and a haughty spirit or an arrogant spirit before stumbling. So when someone becomes arrogant, they fall into the worst kind of of self-deception, the absolute worst kind of self-deception, and that self-deception is called denial. How many people have heard of denial? Dr. Phil's out there. Y'all should know that. Yeah, denial. That's that that self-deception that they fall into, Uh, and it just means that they're refusing to believe something they know is true. For example, I am in denial that pizza is bad for me, and I'm going to stay there because it's warm and fuzzy in that closet. I like pizza. But that is me not accepting the truth about something. That's what denial is. And denial usually happens when believers forget the source of their spiritual gifts. When you start forgetting, and that happens when people lift you up and you believe it, right? I've always told people, don't lift up people in ministry because we're just tools that the master uses. That's all we are. Listen, I'm no more special than anyone else. Usually, Some of the greatest and most powerful people in a church or in the body of Christ are people that no one sees. Did you know that? 
And I want to embarrass him, but I think of Rex Allen when I think about that. I really do. Because he selflessly serves, and nobody's, you know, nobody's sending flowers to Rex's house, and he loves flowers. <laughs> but, no, but he, uh, you know, he just works selflessly just because he loves people and he wants to see the love of God going through. In my opinion, what he does is more important than what I do. I, I, you know, I just feel like you, you can't lift people up because if they do anything good, it's from God. It's okay to say, I like that message or I appreciate your visit or I'm thankful for the time you put in. That, something like that's fine. But always remember that God is the source. And if you lift somebody up, sometimes they believe that. Sometimes they start believing it. And when they start believing it, they forget the source of their spiritual gifts, which, which is God. And as Christians, I think we need to understand that everything we have is from God. Now, we say we understand that, but do we really? I mean, everything that we have, every ability you have is not yours. It's on loan from God. Every possession you have is not really yours. It's on loan from God, and he expects you to use it accordingly, right? Every, I mean, every talent, even every breath that we have is on loan from God. It's a gift, and it's so important. Listen to what James said about this, James 1.17. He says, every good thing given and every perfect gift is from what? It's from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. See, God gives us gifts so that we can glorify him and bring others to us. If your gift is glorifying you, you're using it incorrectly. That's not what it's designed for. It's designed to bring glory to God. I've had people ask me time and time again, why are you so transparent about your issues you had with drugs and alcohol and things like that? And I'm like, first of all, I was raised in this town. Everybody knows anyway. But second of all, I, to me, I am proud of the fact that God was able to take what I was and change it. Amen. That excites me. Because I want other people who are struggling with addictions to realize the world might throw you away and write you off, but God will not throw you away and will not write you off, and he will make changes in you. And so anything God does good through me, I always want to remind people, listen, I'm nothing. If it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be where I'm at. But if what you're doing is bringing the glory to you, you're doing something wrong. You're just doing something wrong, and it's very, very important that you understand that. And I'll tell you, when you start getting full of yourself and getting arrogant, okay, trouble is right around the corner. Trust me on this one. It's right around the corner because... The more independent and arrogant you come, you become, the more you start to alienate God in your life. And we all go through phases where we alienate God a little bit in our life. But the more arrogant you become, the more likely that is to happen. Because once you start alienating God, you start alienating his guidance, okay? And when you start alienating God's guidance, trouble begins, okay? Look at this, Proverbs 14, 12 says, there is a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. death. Right, 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed that he what? That he does not fall. Okay? Have you ever wanted something so bad that you refuse God's advice? Anybody ever done that? Everybody's going, yep. Right? We've all done that at one time or another. You know that prayer where you can't fail? That prayer where you're like, God... I'm going to buy this Escalade even though I don't make enough money. But if you don't want me to, let a pterodactyl come through the roof right now. <laughs> no pterodactyl to the dealership. You know what I mean? Sometimes, sometimes we want something so bad we ignore him. And I don't know how that's worked out for you, but I know how it's worked out for me, and it's never worked out good for me, ever. So really, really important. Arrogance will lead to that. Trust me on that. Now, if we're going to successfully function as a church body, we have to realize something. There is no room for pride, arrogance, bragging in a church because it brings dissension. All of them bring dissension, right? And dissension not only separates people from God, it separates people from each other. All right, that's just one of the byproducts of that kind of action, right? Arrogance says to God and to people, you can't do this without me. That's what arrogance says. I've had people, you know, before, and they don't like to hear this, but I've said this a thousand times. If I were to die tonight, that's not going to change anything here. Sure, you lose the eye candy, but outside of that, <laughs> it's not going to change anything because God 
is behind this movement, and he will put someone else right here. And it will keep going, and it will keep growing. Because this movement, if it's about me, we need to shut the doors right now. It has to be about him. And arrogance says, you can't do this without me, right? But the one who loves with, without arrogance says, I can't do anything unless God enables me to. But with his guidance, I can do anything, right? John fifteen five. I love how Jesus put this. He said, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in, abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Philippians 4, 13. Everybody knows this one, right? Uh, I can do all things through, through him who strengthens me. <laughs> yeah, we have no rhythm, just so you know. You know, none. Let's try that again. I can do all things through. There we go. Shoo, Lord, there's hope. Okay, now, I'd like to spend more time on that, but I can't. Let's move on to the next section. We are actually going to get to verse 5. Oh, yeah, that's how I roll. We get the whole verse in at least every couple weeks. Okay, 1 Corinthians 13, 5. It says, love does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own, is not provoked, does not take into account what? Oh, I can't wait to preach on that. We're not going to get there today because I'm going to spend my time. I'm going to spend my time on that one. Don't get me started. Okay, one of the hardest things to teach people is, especially to teach people about love, is what it means to not act unbecomingly, right? I think we oversimplify what that means. I think we say, well, don't act unbecomingly. That means, you know, go to church, you know, be faithful with your offering, be nice to people, don't murder a people, you know. That's not acting unbecomingly, right? We've kind of generalized it very simply, but that's, that's not really it. It's more than that. It's a lot more than that. I mean, don't take me wrong. All those things are good. I'm not dissing any of those, but that's, there's more to not acting unbecomingly. Because in order to not act unbecomingly, you first have to define unbecomingly, right? So the Greek word uh, for act unbecomingly is asken moneo, okay, asken moneo. And asken moneo means to behave indecently or to behave disgracefully. Okay, now I'm throwing this in for free. Disgraceful is defined as shameful, dishonorable, or disreputable. Okay, so it goes a little deeper than what you think, right? As I said last week, It's not how we treat our friends and loved ones that defines the kind of love we have. That does not define us, right? It's how we treat everybody else that defines how we love in God's eyes. That's what's important. Now, here's the big one, especially especially how you treat people you don't like. Now, let's be honest. We all have people we don't like. Am I right? Is there anybody in here who likes everyone in your life? Liars. (laughs) Liars. <laughs> so here's the look. He's like, not answer another question there again. No, but um, that's a tough one. When I first got saved, I thought to myself, did you just say be nice to people I don't like? That's a typo. That's what I thought. It did not make sense to me, right? But listen to what Jesus said about this, Matthew 5, 43. He says, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. That was how the, the Jews had, you know, had become. Verse 44, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Isn't that tough? Pray for those that persecute you. I'll come back to that. Verse 45, so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. And he sends rain every time Chris washes his truck. Verse 46, (laughs) for if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? Man, there's so much there. How much time do I got? Oh, good. Here's the thing. When I heard pray for those who persecute you, that's a tough one, isn't it? And do you ever feel kind of like a hypocrite when you're praying for the people that you really don't like? Anybody feel that way? Okay, you are not alone. But let me share with you, let me hopefully ease your mind on that one. When you pray for those who persecute you or people you don't like, be honest and transparent with God. Don't get all King James, oh Lord, in thy abundance of thee love, don't do that. Just be honest. Here's the prayer I pray like that. I say, Lord, I am praying for this person because you said I have to. 
I mean, is that why we're praying for them? Had he not said, pray for those who persecute you, would you? No. So I say, Lord, you told me to do this. So that means there must be something good in it. So Lord, do whatever it is you want to do with this person. Bless them however it is you want to bless them. But I still don't like them. But I'm praying for them, and I hope that they find their peace in you. I mean, I'm just honest. Be honest with God. He's not saying, you know, go golfing with them or pick out curtains. He's saying, you know, that pray for them. Just pray for them. That, it, and I know it's tough. It's very tough. But it pains me. We have become so cold as believers. Have you noticed that? The body of Christ has become very cold, right? We are acting more like the very world that crucified our Savior, and it drives me insane. It is difficult for me. Remember, the most, I mean, the most character-defining attribute of God is God's love. In 1 John 4, it says, for God is love. That is the biggest character-defining aspect of Him. And when believers stop loving, people no longer see God in you, right? See, people notice when we're different, right? When, when we should be mad at someone and treating them terribly and we're not, people notice that as different. They see God in that. They know that's not you. When we don't fight back to people who are saying things about us, when we just try to love everybody, it shows people that God is in control in our lives. And that's so, so important, but we're getting so cold, I don't know that that's the case anymore, Right? I mean, it's sad when the most common term used to describe Christians in this day and age is what word? There's a lot of new ones I hadn't heard, man. I think I need counseling. Hypocrites. Have you ever noticed that? Number one thing they say about hypocrites. How sad is that? The most common term used to describe believers is hypocrites. Unbelievable. Because the word hypocrite, here's what bothers me. The word hypocrite means actor. It means an actor. And to be honest with you, believers shouldn't be pretending to love like God. That should be innate. That should be in them already because the Holy Spirit dwells in them. But people see it. We're not genuine with it, and we look like hypocrites. So, I mean, un unfortunately, we've earned that reputation. We have earned that reputation fair and square. And too often, you know, we say one thing, but our actions and our words say something totally different. Right? We love to throw the word grace around. Right? Right? You know what grace means? Unmerited favor, getting something you do not deserve. So we always talk about how much we love grace. We want to show people grace, but we only show it to the people we like, don't we? We don't show it to everybody. We throw that word around like that. And mercy, mercy says that you are loving to people who don't deserve it. Do we do that? I mean, you see it starting to fade, and it really, really scares me. When we start picking and choosing who we're going to love, imagine if Jesus had done that. Can you imagine? I mean, when believers stop showing love and, and grace, you're inviting disunity. You're inviting division. And I'm going to tell you, listen, not just as a coach, but as a pastor, trust me, unity is the single most important part to have, having an, a successful team, a successful church, whatever it may be, a successful company, because love and unity are inseparable. They come as a package deal, right? Because true unity is a byproduct of love. Because people who love the same unify. You see what I mean? So when we fail to do that, it brings disunity, right? And anybody who brings disunity brings unbecoming behavior, unbecoming behavior, okay? And it's really, really important that you understand that. Now, unbecoming behavior for a believer comes in several forms. Now, I could preach on this for a long time, okay? And understand something. When I preach about these behaviors, I'm not saying, oh, you evil people. I sin as much as anybody, just so we're on the same page here, okay? But I'm only going to name a few things uh, that unbe unbecoming behavior kind of comes through believers in this form. Uh, it says, first, talking behind each other's backs and gossiping. That's at the top of the list, but that doesn't happen here, right? That doesn't happen in our church. If someone's a gossip, point at them. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. But this is a big one. Okay, this, this is a big one. This, we're trying to show love to people while backbiting them? And you know what? Has anybody here ever found out somebody's talking behind your back? Raise your hand. It always gets back. It always gets back. Whatever you say, just count down the days, they're going to find out. And when they find out, how much Jesus do you think they're going to see in you? Right? 
How about gossiping? Right? Anybody here ever been gossiped about? Oh, I have. I'm telling you. You could write a book on the gossip about me. Right? And, and to be honest with you, I would, in the Bible, one of the seven things God hates most is a gossip. But some, for some reason, we've given that a pass in the body of Christ. Have you noticed that? We want to talk, we want to, you know, judge other people and judge what they're wearing and judge what kind of music they're listening to. But these old ladies and old men sit after church and have the pastor for dinner behind his back. Everybody's fine with that. Oh, people are people. No, it, it, that destroys a church. It can destroy our faith. Now, being judgmental is the other thing, and, and that's basically making people earn your love and kindness. That is acting unbecomingly. You know, Christians, I don't understand how we can judge. I, I just don't understand it. Because I don't know, maybe you were perfect since birth, and you were healing the sick and walking on water and stuff. I was not. Right? So for every judgment I try to make on someone else, there's three that can come back on me. Okay, it's very important we understand that kind of stuff is pushing people away. And that stuff comes through Christians who have an unbecoming attitude. But, you know, attitudes and actions like this cause disunity and it will kill a church. Now, the Bible is really clear about success, the success of those who learn to display the love of God. Look at this, 1 John 2.10. It says, The one who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. See, Jesus' earthly ministry was marked by his actions, his love and his mercy and the grace that he was displaying to everybody. So if you want to ensure that you're not acting unbecomingly, imitate that. Imitate that. That's, that's the easiest way, you know, because Jesus didn't require people earn his love. If he would have, we'd all be in trouble. He just offered it to anyone who would take it, and he's still offering it today. Now, I can't go much further on that if I want to move to the next one. Um, love does not seek its own. Ooh, how much time do we have? Okay. Um, 1 Corinthians 13, 5. Does not act, love does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own, is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered. Is it wrong that I am so excited about preaching those last ones? I think I said that already, didn't I? Okay. Now, we live in a world that pushes this only look out for number one mentality. Have you noticed that? You know, only, I remember this one guy used to say, it's a dog-eat-dog world and you're wearing a milk bone for a collar. Listen, I get that, but that's what we push. We push that mentality, and, and, and in reality, this is the polar opposite of everything that Jesus taught us. Okay, we're not supposed to be looking out for number one. We're supposed to be looking out for others. I love how Paul describes Jesus' attitude in Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 5. He says, Have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. That word grasped means exploited. Verse 7, But emptied himself, taking on the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of man. Being found in an appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of cross, even, or to the point of cross, to the point of death, even death on a cross. So there is no room for, for self-seeking, self-righteous, or unloving attitudes in our faith. Can you imagine if Jesus had been self-seeking? None of us would have gotten redemption. Can you imagine him saying, hold up, hold up. I come down here with good intentions, but did you, did you say I have to get arrested and beat? You're, you're going to, to beat me. And then you're going to kill me. Hard pass. Can you imagine if he'd have done that? We would have all been in trouble. Now, I'm going to... You, I want you to see something, just how selfless he was. I'm going to tell you a story here that I love. How many people remember where Peter pulled a sword on the guards? How many people? I love that story. So I'll, I'll set it up before I read the last part of it. They come to arrest Jesus, and Malchus, one of the guards, is coming toward him, and Peter pulls a sword. Now, Peter's a fisherman. They don't, you know, use swords, right? And he cuts off Malchus's ear. And everybody says... Everybody says, oh, look at the expert sword. No. He was trying to split him down the middle. He missed and got his ear. That's what happened. He missed and he got his ear. All right? It's not like Peter's going, lose that ear and then show me. No, that's not what happened. He swung it and missed. Okay? And immediately Jesus is like, don't you understand? What, what are you doing? Don't you understand? Look at this, Matthew 26, 52. Then Jesus said to him, put your sword back into its place, for all those who take up the sword shall perish by the sword. Or do you not think that I cannot appeal to my Father, and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? How then would the Scriptures be fulfilled which say it must happen this way? Listen, 
If Jesus were seeking his own, he would have called down 12 legions. A legion is 12,000. That's 144,000 of God's army could have come down and protected him. Can you imagine him saying, Peter, what are you doing? If I wanted protection, it wouldn't be from you. You know, seriously? What are you going to do? Whip him to death with your fishing pole? You know, what would I do? If I wanted this to, if I wanted to stop this, I would call down the armies of heaven and we would decimate this whole planet. I am agreeing to allow this to happen to me because it's not about me. It's about redemption for this world. So this has to happen. I, I just love that. Now, Romans 5, 6 through 8, I want to look at this, give you a little advance. We're going to go there. But the reason he was willing to put up with this was he wanted the world to know this is what love looks like. Now, listen to this, Romans 5, 6 through 8. And pay attention to all the words, all the names we get called in these three verses. For while we were still what? Helpless. Helpless. At the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one would hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man some would even dare to die. Paul's wordy. That means someone might take a bullet for the president, but not for Chris Mosley, right? Uh, Verse 8, but God demonstrates his own love toward us. There again, demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners. sinners. So look at this. We are, look what he calls us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We are helpless, ungodly sinners in three verses. But the point was, that's who you were, and he loved you enough to die for you anyway. That's the whole purpose of that. But when believers move away from that kind of love and love themselves more than they love others, your ministry is impossible. It is impossible to have ministry. Now, this is so evident. I'm going to go on one of my rants real quick, okay? This is really evident, I mean, in the world of professional sports today. How many people have noticed that professional sports pushes the idea that it's about me, not the team? Anybody ever notice that? Let me give you an example. They'll, I almost said a name. Anyway, what happens is they say, okay, I'm not getting paid what I'm worth. And personally, there are people starving all over this country. You're not worth $100 million, my friend. But that's another sermon. Anyway. They say, I'm I'm not getting paid what I'm worth. So they sit out of practices, they sit out of games, leave their team hanging high and dry until they get what they feel like they're worth. And And nowadays, that is, you have to be the highest paid for that position in the history of the world, or you're not getting what you're worth. In the meantime, your team is struggling without you. In the meantime, in your absence, that team is losing and struggling. Listen, kids are seeing that. And that's the way our mindset is shifting. That's not a loving mindset. When you lose your team concept, your team mindset, your team is doomed. And that's the same with believers and church and all the same. When we lose our identity as a team, we are destined to fail. Destined to fail. And this drives me insane. Because I see so many believers who are saying, that message didn't talk to me. I'm like, well, maybe it's not the sender that's messed up. Maybe it's the receiver You know, because listen, not every message I preach may be for you, but it's for someone. You know what I mean? So come and pray anyway. It's not always about us. The reason people switch churches like crazy is because they got their feelings hurt and didn't get their diaper changed in time. And here's the thing. It's not about you. If you're learning and and God is drawing you closer to to him through through the church you're in, stay there. You know, we have got to stop thinking so independently. Because I'll tell you what, the world does not see us as loving. And we've got to see that change. And we definitely have got to learn what not acting unbecomingly and seek our own mean. But because of time, I have to start cutting this short. But to sum this all up, if we want to be effective, whether it be in ministry, whether it be in personal ministry or or ministry as a church or the body of Christ, one of the things we're going to have to do is realize that if love isn't the motivator behind it, you might as well not start. That's the truth. If love isn't behind your motivation for ministry, you're set up to fail. That has to be what drives you. It has to be what drives you. And if it's not, you need to take that to God and get that fixed. Remember when you first got saved, how you were ready to charge the world? You know what I mean? You were we'd witness to anybody. People thought I was crazy. You know what I mean? Well, I mean. <laughs> but people recognized that I was crazy at that time. And as you move on, you're thinking, I should probably say something to that guy. But my pizza might get cold. I'll see if I catch him another day. Have you ever noticed that? We need to rekindle that fire and that love that drove us to be passionate about Jesus. We need to find that again. And we're going to learn a lot more about that as we go into some of the next ones, and I'm excited about that. But I'll go ahead and stop there. We'll pick up there next week. I'm going to ask you to please bow your heads. If this is your first time, we always give a brief invitation. 
Um, we don't ask anybody to come up front or anything like that. By brief invitation, I mean that we want to give you the opportunity to let us pray for you. And if you're not sure where you stand with God, bless those people, or just want prayer. I don't have to know why. Make eye contact me, put your head, bless those people, and I will pray for you. Bless those people. Bless those people. Listen, I really pray. I don't just say it. Bless those people. If you're watching and listening online, God knows your heart. I'll be praying for you. But believers, as I was preparing this message, I was kind of saddened because I am so desperately hungry to see the church hungry with love to show people the love of Christ again. I just want to see that again. I want to see people excited about their faith. And that begins with learning to love again. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for your love and mercy and kindness. I am so thankful that you were willing to die on that cross so that I could have eternal life. I'm so thankful that you loved us despite us. We have nothing to offer. None of us are going to be good. None of us are going to be sinless. We don't have anything to trade. The only way we see heaven is through your love and grace, and you displayed that on the cross at Calvary, and we're so thankful for that. We just pray, God, if there's someone here who doesn't know you, just remove all the hindrances and let them believe that what you did, you did in their place. The debt you paid on that cross was their debt. And if they accept that payment, you promise to give them eternal life. And if they make that decision, I just pray they contact us. And God, for those of us who are believers, take us back to the love we felt when we first believed. Give us the same fire and passion that we used to have. Let us look at people in this world, not with anger or bitterness, but look at them with love because someone did that for us. God, let us live what we profess and it begins by loving. And we just ask as we leave here, God, you would keep us safe. And if you don't return to take us home before we meet again, let us come together one more time and give you the praise, honor, and glory you're so worthy of. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.